Uh, well, uh, uh, good evening. Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, welcome to this uh, Auckland Conversations. I'm Roger Blakely, Chief Planning Officer, and it's my pleasure and privilege to be your MC tonight. And uh, so welcome to this uh, stunning series of Auckland Conversations that we have. Uh, a few weeks ago, I can recognise quite a few of you who are here for Jeanette Sadiq Khan, who gave a stunning presentation uh, in the Aotea Theatre here. And to follow on that sequence of world-class speakers we have here for you tonight, uh, Dr Tim Williams. And uh, we'll tell you more about uh, Tim, and you've probably read uh, all about him in, in uh, the emails that Susan Quinn uh, sent out to you. Uh, so I'd like, like, first of all, to just acknowledge um, important people like our sponsors who, who make these uh, Auckland Conversations possible. Uh, so they include uh, the Architects and Designers New Zealand, uh, Rosine Paints, uh, Jelkin Homes. Uh, our program supporters include uh, the New Zealand Institute of Architects, uh, GIB, uh, Boffa Miskal Landscape Architects, uh, Patterson's Architects, and Brookfield's Lawyer. So could we acknowledge uh, our, 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 our sponsors? Uh, and I'd also like to make a special acknowledgement uh, to the New Zealand Planning Institute, uh, who have confirmed that they are on board uh, as uh, an Auckland Conversation program supporter. So that's uh, fantastic for us, and uh, great to be in partnership uh, with the New Zealand Planning Institute. And thank you to Susan Houston, the president of NZPI. Uh, it's great to see uh, that this collaboration with Auckland Council and the New Zealand Planning Institute and design institutions uh, to bring knowledge experts to New Zealand. That allows us to uh, bring world-class speakers to you. And the Auckland Conversations team will be working closely with the NZPI to create an international planning conference in Auckland in April 2015. Uh, and Auckland Conversations uh, will have the opportunity to present some of the international speakers that will be here for the NZPI conference um, at that time. So um, I'd just like to uh, make a few acknowledgements. Could I first of all acknowledge Deputy Mayor Penny Hulse, uh, who's going to uh, give a speech of welcome to uh, Tim Williams in just a few minutes. Could I acknowledge uh, councillors, uh, several councillors uh, I saw here, uh, local board chairs and members, uh, members of our council controlled organisations, I saw Glenn Wilcox, the Deputy Chair of our Independent Māori Statutory Board. Kia ora, Glenn. Uh, I also saw private citizen Richard Northey. <laughs> he, he, he declares himself to be as such these days, uh, having once been a councillor, or many years a councillor. Uh, could I also just acknowledge, um, uh, you know, all of you are here because you have a passion for Auckland and the issues we're going to talk about tonight, so you're all very welcome. Uh, also, could I acknowledge Deborah Lawson, who's the, uh, the Chief Executive of the Tamaki Redevelopment uh, Company. So just to tell you a bit about the, the programme, so uh, in a couple of minutes I'll be asking uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Penny Hulse to give the welcome ad address and introduce um, Tim Williams, but also talk a bit about the Southern Initiative, which is the, the, the big programme that we were particularly keen to get Tim here to uh, meet with council uh, staff and our stakeholders over the next... A uh, couple of days. Uh, Tim will then give a, a presentation, uh, and uh, we expect that to finish about 6:30 p.m. And there'll then be a question and answer session. So we'll have up here in these uh, comfortable chairs uh, Tim and John McIntyre, the general manager of our Southern Initiative, and uh, they'll be able to answer your questions. And then uh, we'll wrap it up um, by by seven o'clock. Uh, so. Before I hand over to, to, to Penny, can I just tell you a little personal story of how I came to meet Tim Williams? Uh, so we've been uh, talking as we thought about the Southern Initiative um, uh, over recent months about, so, so what are the, what are the, what's the world best practice in urban regeneration? What should we be modelling ourselves on? What can we learn from? And, and the, the big project that's come back time after time when we've asked that question has been the, the Thames Gateway project uh, in East London, the, the urban regeneration of East London, which transformed that part of um, East London and uh, prior leading up to the 2012 Olympic Games. Everyone points to that as being the exemplar. And so we, we thought to ourselves, and we had these conversations with Brett O'Reilly and 
and Patrick um, McVeigh and, um, and John, uh, and we said, well, w- wouldn't it be a good idea if we could somehow engage with whoever it was that was the, the brains and the driver behind the uh, Thames Gateway project? So I've been thinking about how I find this person, and it just so happened that I was uh, uh, in New York in the end of April, as you are, and, uh, and, and I was at a, a, in a boardroom, the, the Ford Foundation, with a group of 14 people who were uh, invited, personally invited by the New York, uh, the Regional Planning Association of New York. And we were invited to be an external international peer review for the development of New York's next regional plan, which we thought was very brave of New York to, uh, to do that. Uh, and so we had people there from uh, London, Paris, uh, New York, uh, Barcelona, Vienna, Moscow, Bogota, Sao Paulo, Sydney, and Auckland, of course. Uh, Mumbai and Rio de Janeiro couldn't get there. Uh, and I found myself sitting next to our esteemed uh, uh, colleague from uh, Sydney, and uh, so I got talking to Tim, who told me first of all that uh, he was the chief executive of the uh, committee uh, for Sydney. Uh, then he told me that he was a, a South Welshman, now living in New South Wales, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, and then he told me that he had been the chief executive of the Thames Gateway Project. And I thought, wow, I've actually, by a complete happenstance, uh, met the person that I've been looking for for months now. And so within about five minutes, I'd signed him up to come here for a couple of days to spend some time with us and with all of our uh, councillors and stakeholders uh, talking about uh, his experiences and how they might help us with the the Southern Initiative. So it's my pleasure now to um, welcome uh, Deputy uh, Mayor Penny Hulse to introduce uh, Tim Williams. Please welcome Penny Hulse. Um, First of all, warm welcome to all of you, the conversation groupies. It's actually quite lovely, conversation after conversation, we're seeing the same people coming and I think our depth of of discussion and knowledge is being enriched by these conversations and certainly just thinking of Jeanette's visit several weeks ago, the spin-off from from the media and the discussions that are now taking place over dinner tables is informed in a different way by, by the conversations and it's an absolute delight that people are talking about urban regeneration and urban design and walkability and ped sheds and all of those sort of things that, you know, a bunch of us anoraks sort of were talking about 15 years ago and people wondered what we were on. So this is a really, really positive time for Auckland that we have these conversations. So thank you, Roger and the team. Um, It's also really inspiring to be here tonight. Roger and I have had a very long day along with my colleagues. Denise and and Chris, we, we've been dealing with everything from the, the bottom of town and the integration with Queen's Wharf, the, the extraordinary downtown area and our, our waterfront and looking at the big plan for that area. We've been looking at the Marine Precinct and Hobsonville. We've been debating and discussing our big strategic priorities for the next 30 years. So this is... I guess a fantastic way to wind down and re-inspire ourselves as we make those some of those very, very important decisions on, on your behalf. So Tim, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, I do have a very extensive bio. Now I know most of us in the room when you stand up, when someone stands up and starts to do your bio, you kind of want to disappear under the seat. But this is, I think, important for people to actually get a sense of, of who this wonderful man is. As Roger said, um, Tim has led um, the the regeneration of, um, of la- you know these huge urban regeneration programs in in the UK and is now in Sydney and has adopted country of Australia um, and he's just been made a member of the Built Environment Advisory Council of the University of Sydney and the adjunct professor of the University of Technology in Sydney. Um, before coming to, to Australia in 2010, Tim was recognised as one of the UK's critical thought leaders in urban regeneration and economic development, and he was named by his peers as the leading personality in the sector in the UK. I presume that's for the depth and intellect of your work, not just because you're jolly fun to go out and have a drink with, but I'm sure being Welsh, we, will, we might see that tested at some stage, and, and you'll stay here. Um, now... Tim has, or Roger's explained to us a little bit of what, what Tim's work has been. 
but between 2005 and 2010, Tim was also a special advisor um, on urban development, strategies, local government and planning to five successive UK cabinet ministers, which is a unique record, it says in my notes. Now, Tom, I'm sure you'll enlighten us as to whether that special record is that you dealt with five separate ministers. And we believe you mean local government. We've had that. We've had five separate ministers in about three years in local government. So we don't think that's that much of a unique record. But your <laughs> persistence through the process, I think, is, is what's unique here. Um, you also have controlled some very large budgets, the $8 billion budget for the Homes and Community Agency and the $25 billion Crossrail project that we've heard a little bit about um, over the last few years and the major renewal to the, uh, the Thames Gateway project which was part of that. Um, I, I think rather than run through this very exhaustive list I will just touch on the, the Southern Initiative. Now, I know that we are going to be hearing a little bit about that, and I just acknowledge John, who's here on, on behalf of the Southern Initiative, and who'll be joining Tim on the stage. In essence, and I think most people know what the Southern Initiative is, if you don't know, the Southern Initiative is one of the key transformative projects in the Auckland Plan that will take a vast part of our wonderful South, will look at the opportunities for economic development, social transformation and physical transformation, building on the strengths of the South, and they are many, huge employment opportunities, a huge employment task force, but a large amount of people underutilised and their capabilities not being fully realised. In essence, the Southern Initiative brings together all of those parts of the puzzle and endeavours to get the best for the whole of Auckland through making the South work in the way that it should. And I'm sure we'll have a chance to discuss that in more detail. So it's with huge warmth, Tim, that we do welcome you. We look forward to your lovely Welsh accent as we listen to you tonight, and thank you for the inspiration. Thank you. I think I'll stop there, actually. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. I've attempted Kiora. Um, uh, that's about it, actually. Um, but I will, I'm sure I'll be tutored by John McIntyre over the next few days. Um, it's a, it's, I want to talk, I think tonight, I'm going to talk about um, a number of things. But uh, uh, I li it, partly it's a meditation on, by the way, it'll be intellectually serious, but in no other sense. Um, but it, uh, it's partly a meditation on something I learned. I went to a, 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 a very uh, conservative Cambridge college, and the philosophy professor there defined conservatism for me, which I thought was brilliant. And he said that in order for things to stay the same, things have to change. And that was the intelligent conservative response, you see. And I thought it was really interesting. I, I've been fascinated by this, because <clears throat> if you try and change places, as I have done, you get interested in to what extent you take the community that's there with you and to what extent you change it fundamentally. And I'm gonna, tonight is a bit of a meditation on what I've learned about this uh, journey. Um, I say it's a beginner's guide. Um, <clears throat> there's lots of uh, crude definitions about this. They're usually about re the remediation of brown land, which doesn't sound very inspiring to me. I like the fancy phrase from Western Australia, which is creating communities through the art of placemaking. Makes me feel very noble. Um, but I thought to myself, what if the communities already existed? So it isn't about creating new communities necessary. And what do they get out of it, the ones who already exist? And the famous Barcelona example, if you've ever been there, it's lovely. But they did actually hose homeless people off the street to achieve uh, excellence in urban design. So there are ironies and contradictions about all, all this stuff, this process of change. Um, also, despite my um, apparently uh, you're, you're, uh, wonderful CV, you, you have to say to yourself, uh, I've learned more from my failures uh, than I've learned from my successes. And when you think I was the chief ministerial advisor on the simplification of the planning system in the UK in 2005, and we made it more complicated. Um, and I was actually uh, the, uh, uh, working for the minister who was announcing boldly uh, uh, in, that w that in 2007 that we were going to increase housing production by 30% and then it collapsed by half. Um, <laughs> then, you know, uh, you have to take it all with a pinch of salt, I think. The, the thing, also, my wife was Australian. And you know, the, I don't know if New Zealanders have the same issue about tall poppy syndrome, um, but she likes cutting me down to size, so she makes me say the following, and I, I do love saying the following because it involves my dad. Um, so in 1999, 
you've got to know who you're dealing with here, right, tonight. So in 1999, the Sunday Times said I was the 17th most important person in London, right? It's very precise, right? It's ludicrously precise. And it was all about one week where I'd done a deal with a Ford Motor Company to retain, it was kind of a great thing, retain production of some kind in East London, but it was one week and one thing, right? The following week, it would never have never been mentioned in the whole list, right? So I was 17th. The Archbishop of Canterbury was 18th. <laughs> and Arsene Wenger, the manager of Arsenal, was 19th, which is the point of the story. So my father, outraged as an Arsenal supporter, wrote a letter to the Sunday Times in the following terms. <laughs> He said, dear sir, last week you said my son Tim Williams was the 17th most important person in London. Full stop. I have to tell you that Tim Williams is not even the 17th most important person in my family. <laughs> That's a true story. Um, so I'm a migratory Welshman at large in Sydney since 2010. Um, but I, I was here, I was in Sydney actually, and I missed... Um, oh, how do I do this? What do I point it at? Oh, there it is. I miss this, which uh, the Welsh regard as the, uh, the equivalent of the uh, Kennedy assassination, uh, for our, which is when our captain was sent off uh, in the World Cup uh, by, I have to say, the French-born referee when Wales were playing against, guess who? France, right? So, um, but of course, it's, uh, where am I supposed to point this thing? Can somebody tell me? Sorry? Sorry? Oh, there, sorry, uh, up there. Um, if you look at it the right way up, it's obviously the French guy was doing the, uh, <laughs> the tactic. And I think, sorry, there you are, I got it. Have I got it? Yeah, sorry. I'm also a fan of this. Um, I don't know if you've seen this website. I'm not an alcoholic. I only drink when Richie McCaw is offside. <laughs> um, which you have to, you have to laugh at, don't you? Yeah, you know, so I think it's good for these guys just to laugh at that. Yeah. I'll say no more. <laughs> um, the other thing is, I am a bit of a... Oh, this is going to be a nuisance. I am a bit of a fan of... Um, we divided by a common love, of course, which was rugby. Uh, but anybody who knows about the 1905 tour, it's not just about the disputed try. It's about when the... Uh, it was when the hacker was first became the kind of uh, tradition that, they, they, that you, you guys used at every tour. And the Welsh responded by singing what, what then was a, a hymn, or a folk song rather, which became the national anthem. So it was a bit unfortunate that 100 years later, we didn't explain this very well, um, because there was a bit of an incident in the car park in, uh, in Cardiff Arms Park where the New Zealanders were so outraged at being asked to move when the haka was performed that they did it in the car park instead. That didn't help, really. So um, I think knowing where you live is really important. I'm a bit of a historian. Uh, New Zealand is, uh, is in the north. Um, I think um, I, I use this because I do think we, we, we need a new perspective on these things. We always think that we're at the bottom of something, you know. Well, we're at the top of the new world. And I think that's quite an important perspective, actually. Psychological distance. But this is even more spectacular. This, if there's one slide you need to look at, this is McKinsey's uh, review of where the center of gravity of wealth was a thousand years ago and where it is now. And it was tr tricky. It was in the, originally in the Middle East, then it went towards uh, obviously the Northwest, the Atlantic, America, and then in the Industrial Revolution as well. And look, it's been tracking back and now really picking up pace. Um, strangely, it's over Kazakhstan at this point in time, but, uh, <laughs> um, but it's heading to its natural home and a kind of neighborhood that you are relatively close to, I think. Um, all right, so I, I'm kind of interested in this. Current metropolitan population of the world, some big people there. Uh, but, you know, they're going to get even bigger, and Europe are obviously going to sort of stagnate a bit. The Americas probably, Southern America will boom, but not the North particularly. So, you know, it's an interesting neighborhood that you've found yourself in. So I'm, I'm kind of a city person. You'll find that I, uh, I'm kind of interested in divided cities. I, uh, my urban regeneration thing, I've now read, sort of thought through as a kind of... Uh, Cities are divided. Do they have to be? Um, and there are. I'm going to. I, th I think it's quite an interesting sort of t uh, coming from a city that's heavily divided, Sydney, between east and west, for reasons I'll go through. Um, why are cities? Cities are the big thing at the moment. Everybody's talking about them. But that density is at the heart of what cities do. And Australian cities are not very dense. 
uh, but, but the reason why cities exist is essentially density. The reason why they offer these various economic and social benefits is actually the, 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 the proximity they offer between skills, people, money. Density is at the heart of what cities do. Um, sorry, let's go back. Let me go back and first. Um, interestingly, 30% more patents where job density uh, doubles. So where there is more and more jobs, there are more and more patents. Uh, Stadtluft macht frei was the uh, medieval phrase of the Hanseatic ports. City air makes you free. Um, but look, what I'm going to talk a bit about is that the, the new thing in my trade is where do the 25 to 34 year olds want to live? And what kind of environment do they want to live in? Uh, and cities throughout the world, they're calling it the great inversion where, um, where uh, essentially successful people 50 years ago wanted to live out in the suburbs, now they want to live closer into the CBD action. That's a, an international phenomenon, um, but it's got its own problems associated with it. Um, but I'm also very interested in what people are calling arrival cities. So Auckland's an arrival city. Where do the migrants go? In Sydney, they go to the far west. 40 years ago, they went to the inner city, which was much better in terms of integration. And now they go to the far edge. They're now living 35, 40 kilometers from the CBD. Okay. Um, where do the Kiwis live? Uh, they live uh, where the, the English live. They live in Manly. They live in the eastern suburbs. They live on the, on the coast. Uh, where do the Chinese and Indians live? They don't live on the coast. And I'm very interested in global migration patterns and how they, they restructure cities and where people go within them. And these are very different scenarios. And I think maybe it may be of relevance in Auckland. I speak with hesitation. I've been here three times. By God, I'm no expert. So, uh, um, but, you know. So uh, just as an aside, I was in Perth last week. That uh, big dog-like shape is, uh, is, the, um, is, the, is the spread of Western Australia. But the, uh, the, the carbon footprint of Perth in 2050 covers most of, of France uh, and Spain. Um, so um, Australia's got big problems with its, how it runs its cities. Um, and the car is, is part the heart of the issue. Um, just to speak uh, truth to power, um, I'm very interested in what city leaders do, having worked with many of them in, in London. Smart growth, we're going to talk a bit about that. They're going to have to do more with less because the public sector is in that space everywhere. Um, they win support for change. That, for me, has become the biggest failure of the political system at the moment in Australia is that there's not a, a lot of boldness. I'm very intrigued by the, the, the mayoral model that you've got in Auckland. We look to it with envy because it's big and it's bold and it's big city thinking. We think that's necessary. Um, but there needs to be a civic discourse as well. Many professionals in the room, we need to stick our hands up here. We, we talk about density and stuff, but people run a, a million miles away from it. There's a gap in the civic discourse we need to really be honest about, I think. Um, this was my concerted thinking about five years working on East London stuff and, and delivery vehicles. These are mother and apple pie, but boy, are they difficult to get in one place at the same time. <coughs> Vision, leadership, implementation plan, network of partners. It's not just you alone doing big stuff. Getting the resources, getting the central support. I think all this might be relevant to the conversation we have here. Monitoring of progress, very rare in, in big city projects. I think very rare. Um, Punchlines before I forget, understand your city. Metrics are hard to find, but understand your city. People and place, I'm going to talk about people and place, not just one or the other. Who is there now in these places you wish to transform? Are they engaged in the process? Uh, do you have metro, metro governance? You do. Um, but collaboration, it's not just a one, one trick pony, this thing about collaboration has become the big city differentiator. Cities that collaborate are succeeding. The American evidence of that is very compelling. Public, private, uh, sectoral regions, uh, you know, all parts of the community. Can you find a way of engaging them in a collaboration for your city? My own metric, 47. The uh, 47 is the median age for those neighborhoods that have least crime, most wealth, and are healthiest. So I decided that, that my objective in life was to get more neighborhoods with more 47-year-olds living in them. I'd be banned. I'm in my mid-50s. Um, don't ever pay for consultancy ever again. So I just use this. What do you want to do with the strategy? What, why, when, how, where, and who McKinsey's are now, can now retire. 
This is where I'm from. It's a mining village in South Wales. Very unglamorous spot. Um, it's a public housing estate, estate idyllic. Uh, a thousand jobs to the right within five minutes walking. School to the top within five minutes walking. Shops within five minutes walking. Um, now more or less bankrupt because the, the economic model that underpinned it was resources based. Two of my relatives died in that pit that's just about 15 minutes walk away. Um, and basically that's what it looks like now, which is kind of, you know, resources based economies they don't last discuss. Australia, think about it. Um, lived and worked in East London. And so I'm going to talk a bit about this, talk a bit about the uh, Sydney experience and then see if some of these big international issues about cities are relevant to this conversation here. So rebranding of Thamesgate. Why was it called Thamesgate? Because East London had a bit of a kind of, you know, uh, kind of dodgy geezer kind of feel about it. Um, so they became the Thames Gateway. And I came up with this phrase, which, uh, which became a kind of more than marketing, which is London's going east. And that actually galvanized thing, people back in 97, 98, when we couldn't give away the East London proposition in 97. Um, so it's the area of East London with the, the Tower Bridge east on both sides for about 20, 30 miles, depending on how you draw it, through a heavily migrant community now, today. Um, but look. The early stage of it was the Docklands Development Corporation, where now Canary Wharf is. And by the way, if you think that great ideas only come from great thinking rather than political necessity, there was a riot and series of riots in our cities in England in the early 80s. And the conservative minister, uh, Heslin, great guy, wrote a cabinet paper, which is the best title of any cabinet paper you have ever thought of. It's called It Took a Riot. Right? And it took a riot to bring investment and reinvestment to the unglamorous bit of our cities that we'd forgotten about, where the riots took place. Okay? Um, but Canary Wharf, first stage, 100,000 new jobs where there had been docks, derelict, $250,000 average salary, but 50% of the local community is on benefits. There's no link. And I think that's the challenge of some big regeneration projects. They do great economic things. What do they do for local communities? It's, a real, it's not something I've got a complete answer to, but I think it's the question. Um, and then we brought the Olympics to East London on the back of all this stuff. Bit of a nuisance. Okay. A um, couple of general points. When you're in a regeneration thing, don't, don't just put, put out the begging bowl. What's your offer? What are you offering to government and to the rest of the city? Why should they bother? So, what's the offer? Then, what's the ask? Um, so, we needed massive public investment. We got it rail, light rail, channel tunnel, rail link, metro. I failed to get a bridge. It's my biggest failure. There are 20 bridges west of Tower Bridge and two east of Tower Bridge, we failed. Um, then we created uh, delivery vehicles. The government created a, a strategic partnership between the local authorities, London gov regional government and national government around the Thames Gateway. Um, we had a range of delivery vehicles, including development corporation. Um, and then the, the Olympics itself, when it came in 2004, was the Regeneration Olympics on the back of the East London project. And that had a development corporation, but we also tagged onto it because the local authorities were desperately keen to make sure this wasn't a rerun of the, of, the, of the 80s, but actually involved the local community and created a place as a legacy rather than just a bunch of buildings. So that's a critical thing. So we had all sorts of vehicles and discussions around this development corporation to make sure it, we humanized it and made it and socialized it really. Um, but, but the big idea we came up with, and I'm going to talk about this tonight, was convergence as our objective. Convergence being, in 20 years' time, the east of London would have the same socioeconomic outcomes as the average for London. You know, what do you want? We're fighting for the right to be average, right? But it was a radical thought in, a, in an area of disadvantage that we would, in 20 years' time, have the same outcomes as the rest of London. That became the organizing principle of our urban regeneration project. I, I urge all people to think about what their organizing principle is. What's the absolutely structural objective that you have rather than a, a, a bunch of small objectives? Um, there it is on a map, uh, Elephantine, but most of the population lived in East London. This is the critical diagram, that L for London, which will recur in some slides I'll show. That's the Thames Gateway and the Lee Valley and the Fulcrum is where the Olympics was uh, two years ago, 18 months ago. Um, and that map is the London map, <coughs> the London plan. Ken Livingston, the London mayor, had only two. We captured 
the London Mayor and his plan for East London. <coughs> there were only two dimensions in the London Plan in 2001, ever upwards, tall buildings, and ever eastwards. Everybody can understand this plan. Sorry. That then led to the slightly East European looking uh, <laughs> buildings. And if it's, I was an advisor to Lendlease on this, so again, you know, I can't avoid any responsibility for this. But uh, that was Stratford. Um, and I worked on this. So I worked on this before it was this, because uh, this is when I was working on it. That, that's 1921. I'm, I'm, I'm younger than I look at. Um, that's 1921, but that's the industrial, that's where the stadium is. That's in one of the industrial heartlands of, of London. Um, that's when I was working on it, and we were trying to promote something to happen on a big brownfield site, an ex railway yard. And we didn't know it was the Olympics at the time, but we started, no, we started lobbying for it actually in 2001. Um, that's what it started getting when it was being built. Um, and <laughs> if, you, if you told me that our objective was to get a Westfield in uh, Stratford, I would have said, uh, I, think, I don't think so. Um, you, you can see that thing from the moon. It is, uh, <laughs> it is massive, but it has changed the entire perception of, of what Strat Stratford is. Um, and it sort of makes it a normal experience. You know, people think, oh, yeah, I go shopping in Stratford. They never would have said that. So it's very important. Um, and they're good guys. Oh, come on. Right, this is my failure. Um, so I had this idea that this is the Olympic Boulevard to uh, the, the stadium from the Bangladeshi heart of East London. And we called it the Olympic Boulevard. So I went to the Olympic authorities and they said, fantastic idea. Why had nobody brought this to us before? Brilliant. And just as I was to say, thank you, can you give me some money to support this? They said, if you give us 10 million pounds, you can call it the Olympic. <laughs> and I said, well, I, don't, I haven't got 10 million pounds. So uh, then I went to the London Development Agency and they said, really love this, fantastic. Why have nobody brought this idea to us before? And just as I was to ask them, they said, but you can't call it Boulevard. And I said, why can't I call it Boulevard? And they said, because that's French. <laughs> so we call it High Street 2012, which I don't think is the same. I did some funky things involving artwork down a major motorway. And the trouble was, on the first night of opening, some guy was so fixated by these lights, he drove off the motorway into the lights. But, uh, <laughs> and I have a flat 100 meters, because this is the problem, right? We, did all, we were doing all this stuff, and we, we lost sight of us a few things. Th this was the riots in London about six months before the Olympics, right? And it's the challenge I want to talk about, because this is, we didn't expect this. We actually thought, you know, I felt like uh, actually uh, in 1953 when the, the G German workers rose up against the communists, uh, Bertolt Brecht uh, heard that the Communist Party leader had written something saying that how disappointed the party was with the people. And uh, Bertolt Brecht wrote, uh, well, if the, the answer is obvious, you must dissolve the people and elect another. And uh, <laughs> um, I feel the same about that. Um, that's Canary Wharf with that 100,000 people earning about 50% on benefits. There you go. Um, just as an aside, you know, this isn't all entirely serious. This man was Blair's chosen successor. And he didn't work out, partly because he st used this stupid banana thing when he went to a conference one, and nobody took him seriously ever again. I was working for him. The banana incident will not be forgotten in his household. So, uh, um, but I also worked for Blair, or B. Liar, as not, not just most people used to think of him in the end. My father, his dying words, literally was denunciation of Tony Blair. Marvellous. He just had to be there. Um, the, um, uh, I work for Gordon Brown as well, and I don't know what's happening with that hand. It doesn't look very dignified to me. Um, work for Boris Johnson, um, who's, an, who's an elegant and wonderful chap, uh, who keeps great friends, is the other I'd say, brother. Um, <laughs> I haven't worked for uh, Tony yet, who, who can only be referred to as the member for Manly. Um, and, uh, and by the way, um, if you, go, if you Google images of Manly, you get, you get this somewhere. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, you get, um, you get Sean Connery. I think Tony, Tony is modeling himself on that image, actually, is what I think. Um, so, right. So I'm very interested in how places work, how they flourish how they decline, how to get revitalized, all these kind of interesting things. What does a regenerated community look like? What does it mean? 
uh, and how you achieve the best results. And we're going to talk a bit about that now. We might, the next half, the second half, is there a momentum? I like asking, is there a momentum in, behind a place? There's a completely different challenge if a place is like my hometown, you know, basically remained it in the 1920s. Uh, is, it, is it good money after bad? Uh, also, there's a kind of world is split between places with houses and no jobs and, and places with jobs and no houses. I, every time I say that, people think that's simplistic, but it fits quite well for me. Um, 47 we've done. Uh, also very interested in what people know about themselves. The data they have is becoming really important. People don't know very much about their own cities. Uh, what's the offer? What's the ask? Okay. So, convergence. Let me talk about this. So, so we decided in East London, after about 10 years of projects, that we needed to understand what we were doing. You'd think we'd start with that, but we didn't, we didn't start with that. We started with projects. Um, and we suddenly realized that what we, were, what we wanted was this convergence thing. So we then invented this list of, of indicators and outcomes that if, if you improve these, you probably get the city to rebalance. Educational attainment, skills, economic activity, reduction in child poverty, increase in life expectancy. People in East London were living seven or eight years less than in West London. Uh, reduction in housing overcrowding, reduction in violent and gang crime, right? Um, so that's the objective. Within 20 years, the communities who host the 2012 Games, this is the legacy thing, right? will have the same social and economic chances as their neighbours across London. I like it. But what, why should anybody care about it except if you're concerned about poverty? Well, the answer is we were holding back the rest of London. Unless they liberated us to, to create this productivity, they couldn't get this big win. So the offer and the ask. So by, we're offering you high, a higher productive, more productive city, a more equitable city is a more productive city. That's what we offered. And the ask is give us all the infrastructure give us all the investment, give us the, give us the Olympics and other things. Um, so it's about closing the gap in performance. It requires commitment and action across a whole range, across government, across tiers. Lond London, the London Mayor, Boris Johnson, Conservative, is committed to the convergence criteria uh, and all his agencies. Um, I'm very interested in social capital, by the way. We can have a chat about this. There's a difference between bonding capital and bridging capital. I grew up in a community that had strong bonding capital, but very limited bridging capital. Um, and bridging capital is what gets you economic success. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about total place as an idea. Total place is you, you tot up how much government spending is going into a place. Uh, and then you work out how you can cut that whilst improving services. Um, but it's co convergence, this is critical, is also about making neighborhoods of choice and connection. So you're not, you don't succeed in regeneration unless people want to live there. And not just everybody, or rather, not, not just necessarily, and this is the very interesting and very difficult challenge, it seems to me, not just the people who are there at the moment. That's that we've got a, we, the, the mixed communities proposition is at the heart of convergence, but it doesn't just mean diluting, it must mean something more than that. It must be a, mean about giving new opportunities through mixed communities for the existing community. I think that's the serious proposition. Um, so I think also, so we need to understand the forces that create the residential sorting that lead to poor places. We tend to demonize people who live in poor places instead of understanding that these are the places they end up in uh, because nothing else is available to them. And also, by the way, that there are area effects that then reinforce poverty. Um, so we wanted to break the cycle. I think, I think that an urban regeneration objective that doesn't want to break the cycle of deprivation is not an urban regeneration objective. I, um, so um, mixed communities I've talked about. I'm going to talk in conclusion about three or four ideas that are related to this. But one of them is about this new thing that's on, on the block called innovation districts, which are mixed-use walkable districts. And I want to talk about the economic opportunities of that. I want to talk about a talent attraction strategy um, because we've been obsessed with place and brownfield transformation all this kind of stuff. But who's going to live in your place and how do you get them? How do you anchor them? Um, and I'm also this huge challenge of seeking renewal in, in existing community benefit not in the absence of gentrification, but in the context of it. Because I don't think it's either or. An economic renewal that does not bring in economically successful people is a contradiction in terms. But that doesn't mean that they push everybody out. That's the challenge. So, if I can get, move on. Sorry. I'm in real trouble with this. Right. Oh, sorry. Just to put some science behind it, and you can have a look at all these slides, but this is a, we did a kind of, we did a kind of, we worked out what was causing 
poor areas to be poor areas. And um, what we discovered, by the way, was in, a, in, a, in a, an area that, 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 where the indices stayed stubbornly the same for 50 years, 40 years, they, what, what, you, what was concealed in that was individual social mobility where people legged it. They got, they got a job or they got um, you know, higher qualifications, then they left the area, and then other poor people came in to replace them. And therefore, the indices stayed the same, hiding real individual success for, for people, as, but not for the place, right? And it's, this is about how remaindered places get created by wider ec external economic forces, but then reinforce themselves, crime disorder, poor livability, unpopular neighborhood in, in repair. How do you break this cycle? Um, and I would like to move on. And we just looked at um, some of the indicators. We, we, we've honed in on obvious territories, supporting healthier lifestyles, developing successful neighborhoods, and creating wealth and reducing poverty. That, the, there's more science behind the, the list we can talk about again. But that's, that's what we decided to, to do and to actually put a, a real attempt to monitor progress with a kind of rag system about whether we were actually getting anywhere. Census doesn't help, obviously, because it's every 10 years. So. Um, now, this is critical, right? So um, what we're looking for in a neighborhood of choice and connection um, is, is a structural change in performance of that place. How do you get a structural change in performance of that, of that place? Um, and again, neighborhood of choice, what does it mean? Attracting new higher earning residents while encouraging locals to stay. That's the trick, right? And why are they of connection? Because they must be accessible to good education and training and job opportunities. That arrival city scenario I told you about where migrants come in 40 years ago in the inner city of Sydney, that was, they were in connected communities. They now live in dispersed, low density on the edge. This is not going to work. Um, if you improve housing but not socioeconomic mix, opportunities will be constrained, particularly where school allocation is based on local residents. So if you're wondering why you can't break through, it's because you do need a mix in order to do that. Uh, but if you improve job prospects of individuals, they go. Uh, and other poor people come in and the cycle continues. So we've talked about that. But that's critical. That's a big understanding. Roundtree, 100 years ago, talked about the underlying cause of weakness or evil in the community. I can't spell, by the way. Or evil in the community. I think most neighborhood efforts are, are don't get this right. And they, they fix things. They fix the, they fix the epiphenomena of poverty and, and disadvantage rather than fix the structural issues. So they fix the housing. They do urban design in the town centers. And it's all good stuff. They might even try and do a lot of money in the local schools. But I think they're super, what Browntree called them, superficial manifestations of the urban settlement pattern where the poor are residentially sorted or remained at that. I, you know, I make no moral judgment about this. I just think this is objectively the case. Um, so rebalancing the urban settlement pattern is, is, is really critical to this discussion, I think. Uh, and it's more important than just clever financing or delivery vehicles or governance. It's a key understanding. What are you trying to do? Uh, I'm interested in all this stuff we talk a bit about. I'm going to talk inclusion going forward now. I'm really interested in demography. I'm really interested in, in who's shaping our cities. Women graduates, people just think, they've, we've absorbed this, thinking this, this, this is an amazing big fact. The two graduate family, which didn't exist 40 years ago, is completely reshaping cities. These, these are the guys in Sydney that don't want to live in the suburbs anymore because they're time-hungry people that can't afford to, and they've got all sorts of limitations. They both work, and it's, it's forcing people back to the, to the city. It's, it's a really big phenomenon. Um, multiple home ownership in Australia is, is a big issue through the tax system. Transport choices, right? Um, there's an international delusion that you can co sort congestion out by building more roads. It's just absolutely, completely opposite of the truth. We live through it every day in Sydney. They want to build more roads, but... Uh, it's just not true. And it actually leads to a, a more sprawled community. And sprawl equals poverty in the modern world. That is exactly the, the scenario we need to understand here. That because the successful are now living in, and they get on public transport, and they work with their iPads at 7 o'clock in the morning, and then you know, other people are now living further and further out. And sprawl equals disadvantage in the modern world. Um, get this going. Right, so this is the challenge. So in East London, now great transformation. This is the advertising for Lendlease for the, the, 
the, the, the hole in the ground I worked on for 10 years, eight years. And it's not even called East London anymore, it's East Village. Right, branding again, right? It's, a, it's the newest neighborhood. But look at it, lush wetlands, fully grown trees, great. Local independent shops, cafes and bars. This is going to my, my final strand of urban thinking, which is about what are people looking for. So, oh, sorry, the last bit is very important to this discussion. If I can get back. Sorry about this. Right. Right. Social mobility, tipping points, communities buying into this change. So it's not a done to thing, it's a done with thing. How do we, how do, we do this? So they can shape it, they must shape it. So affordable housing needs to be part of the scenario. And not just public housing, affordable housing. Um, but sprawl, I just want to big idea, equity, it's an equity and a health issue. Um, part, you know, part of why there's an ob uh, uh, obesity and a di diabetes 2 explosion in, si in Sydney is because people are now unable to walk or to cycle to anywhere. Um, and they're not working in heavy manufacturing anymore. Um, so, right. Some areas encourage social mobility. There's some recent studies by the H Harvard, which are just brilliant, at uh, showing that, that social mobility is actually um, lower in Atlanta than it is in Detroit, right? And so what's the matter with Atlanta? Well, partly it's a structural issue again. The city is too spread out. Job opportunities are literally out of reach for people stranded, okay, in the wrong neighborhoods. Sprawl may be killing social mobility. Okay, so this is not a fancy urban design issue anymore. Is what I think. Um, San Francisco, a child born into the bottom fifth, has an 11% chance of making it to the top. But Atlanta, it's only 4%. It matters. The way you structure your city matters. Surprisingly, uh, the, the Harvard study says race is not a big issue. Um, class is a bigger issue. And sp where you live is a bigger issue but a significant correlation with existing level of inequality. So areas with a, with a smaller middle ranking are do worst. Significant correlation where, you, where people live apart and the ability of the poor to rise is linked to it. And Atlanta, poor and rich neighborhoods are far apart because basically everything is far apart. Okay? Um, but this is inter interesting. The apparent inverse relationship between sprawl and social mobility obviously reinforces the case for smart growth, i.e. the compact city higher density. These are not urban design issues. These are equity issues. These are economic issues. This is not some marginal discussion anymore. Uh, and it's not even about the environment. In it. So um, tax breaks weren't the issue. The physical geography of metropolitan areas is an issue. Um, four factors, all else being equal. Upward mobility tended to be higher in metropolitan areas where poor families were more dispersed amongst mix mixed income neighborhoods. That is a critical finding. Okay. Um, move on. Right, so this is, comes back to London, and I worry about this, but although it's a success. So this is, well, it's, at the top is Hackney, East London, but a mile from the city corporation area. So affluent young professionals, but also baby boomers retiring, are retiring to the inner city, not to the coast. And in, in Australia, they're doing the same. Um, so so the places that have gone down market in the last 10 years are, on the old, are, are the old suburbs. The things that have gone up market are the ones that are in East London. And just to show you the effect of that startling map in the, precisely the area that I was working in for 10 years, if I can get to it, is this. The red, all that area, that L is the Thames Gateway where I was working in, that sort of north and east, the docks, all to the right of the picture, that's the fastest, that's the change in socioeconomic demography. So the areas that have gone up, the social, uh, the, the social scale as it were, are entirely in East London, and the ones that have gone relatively down are outside. Isn't that a big finding? Uh, so we thought this is the old model, that the successful lived on the edge and the poor lived in the middle. And in America they call it the great inversion. It's a massive force everywhere. And it leads me to... So we're worried in Australian cities 30 years ago about the donut, um, you know, empty middle. Um, but they're now the economic driver. And M Melbourne, inner city, 30 years ago, had 150,000 jobs. It now has 500,000 jobs. Okay? 
shortly. I'll finish shortly. Okay. So we're seeing a reversal in which the inner city, which a generation ago connoted poverty and slums, now means opportunity, but for whom is the question. Um, and now the smallest segment in the market in Sydney for homes is the family seeking a four-bedroom house, by the way. That's the smallest segment in the market because there's a demography going on of smaller families and retirees. Okay. So uh, there's an inward job, rush of jobs to the inner city. The knowledge economy is clustering in the centre. It is not dispersing at this point in time. It is clustering around CBDs, whereas the, whereas the manufacturing economy was a dispersed one. And just to prove it, the, the red is the poor areas of Sydney and the, the lighter on the east are the well-off areas of Sydney. What does it mean? It's the knowledge jobs have been coming back to the city and the housing has been going west. So that we are very clear what's reshaping our cities. That's just to show the difference between Melbourne and Sydney. But just to point out, Parramatta over there is 20 kilometres from the centre. There are 2 million people living west of that point in Sydney today. So a long way from economic action, right? Affects, affects house prices. Vulnerable communities in a city. So the... Uh, so you've got basically low exposure to mortgage and fuel costs and high, the red are the danger areas. They live on the edge of our cities at this point in time. Demography is driving change in a way I've talked about. People want to live at the moment within five kilometers of a CBD. So my proposition for Auckland and for Australia, for Sydney is the same thing, is that we can't have everybody living within five kilometers of our CBD. So is there a polycentric city where we replicate some of the attractions of the urbanity, urbanism, everything that people are looking for in this demography in four or five places in our city rather than one, because I think we're going to have to. Um, we're, also we're, we're also watching people no longer want, want to work in ex-urban incubators. They want to work in, in, in a city area so they can go out and have a, a, a latte at lunchtime, basically. Uh, I've talked about two graduate families. Educated cities, this is a real issue. Educated cities with the... F with key, with the f with the fastest, sorry, the the, the, one of the strongest predicts of income growth is level of education. The 10 best educated cities in the US grew twice as fast as the others. Um, I talked about that. Right, last thing, I've got three slides to go, so I'm just finishing. Um, so, where, we're, where we've got to in this is that certain kinds of environments are attracting the successful. And counter to what a lot of people think, they're actually attracted, that, that we heard it from Penny, Walkable ur urbanism is the attractor at this point in time. They're, 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 people want to live in these particular districts. They have thick labour markets. You can, they have knowledge spillovers. You can talk to somebody in the cafe and make money. It's, it's a completely sort of transformed universe. We've got to get our heads around, it, around it, what it means for us. Um, so look at this. This is some economic proposition. Walkable commercial neighbours in Washington have 75% higher office rents. So it's not a fancy thought in my head. So to conclude, we need to be about people in place. Um, we need to understand what churn there is, why people leave, who comes in, what does that mean? Do we want to intervene in that? Or do we think that's a benign scenario? Um, I think we, attracting young, this, uh, attracting and anchoring these 25, 34 year olds is a critical success factor for a city and I think also for sub-regions within a city. Place matters. Um, and talent attraction matters. More than, more than investment, more than inward investment, inward talent matters to the vitality of a community. Um, and why is education improved? Because knowledge economy has come. You need knowledge to be successful. So, um, they're calling these places that this kind of metro, the, 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 the millennials want to live, in innovation districts. They combine a number of the features of historic infrastructure. Waterfront locations are very attractive. Uh, good urban design. Good, you know, everything that we kind of in the room probably think we, we like, actually. But they're also providing a physical and social platform for entrepreneurial activity. This is the new fact. Um, so a, a kind of in-town incubator space. Okay? And we're wending our way to the conclusion, which I've talked about that. And we've talked about that. If you just bear with me. So I think regeneration and city vitality are actually partly about human capital strategies as well as place strategies um, and the educational level of your community. Um, yeah, 
Right, and, but, but to come back to my central problem, how do you get change without change? You know, how do you get, make sure that the local community benefits? I think they need to be heavily involved in shaping this discussion. I think you need to, uh, I think the, the public housing revolution needs to be part of this. We need to talk about higher density. A lot of poverty is now associated with where you live and lower density accommodation exacerbates poverty. So the fact that 80% of people who live in the Southern Initiative are living in, in separate homes is, is not necessarily anymore a very good thing in terms of the economic infrastructure of the future. Um, actions. I think people need to be more the focus of, of our economic and regeneration development than they've been. I think we need, you need, we need to create sub-regions where women and ethnically diverse young people can achieve their goals. Uh, investing in higher education is important, but it won't solve the problem if there are no jobs. Uh, vibrant urban, neighbor, urban neighbourhoods are not just an urban design thing, they're an economic asset. So how do you create four or five of these places in a city rather than one? Um, and, but a unique identity still is a very important sort of sales factor in the regeneration world. And this is, it just pleases me. Nobody actually wants to live in Adelaide, right? But the Adelaide do brilliant things in terms of uh, city engagement. And, you know, and they looked at this as the traditional way with engaging with the community, which is that... Uh, um, you talk to them at the end in the private sector and they just thought it was easier to do that, which is to start with the community and then work up. But to have an honest discussion about the issues that I've raised tonight with the community I think is critical. Um, and then there were ten factors that the Adelaideans thought was important. And I think I'll end with these. Be human-centred, see things as systems, value community by engaging, vision, value experience objectively, test things through design, collaborate, and then monitor. And then I've got this maps of... I, I've just thought polycentric Auckland, what would that look like? Well, perhaps it's a reality. Um, but look at this, right? These are, these are definitely my last slides. This is change in density population uh, over the last um, five or six years, where the, 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 bigger, the, the, the lighter areas are the relatively unchanging ones. And you've got the Southern Initiative, it's got some areas of radical growth and others not. And if you look at the the, the western edge of it, and then look at it again when you look at this map, you see this, um, where you've got uh, median personal income is, uh, is, is the lowest uh, in the same area which has not seen the growth. Um, and you also do this, which is percentage of dwellings that are multi-unit, and they're also quite low in the same areas. And I just think there might be links between these things. So I'm going to end. Um, it's been a bit of a romp around my world. You're welcome to it. Um, but I've learned a few things, and in all humility, I think how you get change without change is like interesting, um, and, and your city is a great place to try and actually win some of these uh, issues, because they haven't all been won everywhere else, but I think we've learned things that can inform the discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank God for that. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Tim, for that. Uh, so we're now going to have a, um, a question and answer session. So we've got Tim and John McIntyre, the general manager of the Southern Initiative. Uh, I'll triage the questions uh, uh, to Tim or, or John. I won't triage the answers. And so I think the first question was over here, right? Uh, the, yeah, we've got a ro roaming microphone. So, and please just uh, introduce yourself when you, when you ask your question. Hello, Tim. On. Hello, my name is Rob Mayo. Um, just got a question, just a comment first and then a question related to that. Uh, the Great Inversion that you talked about, I've lived for, in Japan for many, many years, and that Great Inversion has been present in Tokyo for well over 80 years with the kind of distributed cluster satellite hub and spoke system, the economic assets you talked about uh, that Sydney and Auckland should take up, that's been present for some time in, in Japan. Yeah. Um, connected to that, you talked about the neighbourhoods of choice and connection. Could you define further the connection aspect, please? I think it's, it's, couple of, I think it's partly physical and partly um, virtual and partly metaphorical. I think the, met, the, the physical connect connectivity is um, if you can't access... That, that, those two maps I showed you of Melbourne and Sydney and they just went like that was about effective job density and how many jobs you can access within an hour uh, of your place. And that effective job density... Uh, issue is critical to the success of a particular neighbourhood. And excuse me, a neighbourhood that, that can access more jobs more quickly are more attractive. 
metaphorically, I think it's partly about, and I grew up in a community that had, I think, some elements of introspection. So I think it's partly about the bridging capital. That's quite a critical and disadvantaged community, the, this bridging capital notion. And there, there, there appears to be less of it in some communities than you'd like. So on, on the virtual, it's partly about making sure that we have the best um, uh, digital connectivity in a world where I think we are redesigning work and, and, and its locations, but they, they aren't f quickly going to the suburbs. They are quickly going to the peri-CBD edges. Uh. Yes, good evening, Tim. That was a, a great presentation. Um, my name is Roger Eccles. One of the, your presentation did raise a lot of issues, I thought, though, and um, I'd just like to question you about uh, yeah. some of those. Uh, back in the 1980s, I, I lived in Surrey Hills, and um, uh, I had a Lebanese next-door neighbour. Now, if that Lebanese neighbour moved out to Western Sydney and got a swimming pool and a couple of cars in the garage. Yeah. Is, is that such a bad thing? No. I'm not sure. And also, no. like, one of the things about, um, you know, the technology and, and um, IT is that place didn't matter, so that you could work anywhere. You could work in the national park or you could work in the inner city. So okay. that's another thing. And just one last point. Sorry. There is a danger, I think, and I'm not sure what your thoughts are about this, is that we perhaps design cities that planners like, i.e. the cities where you can go and drink coffee and socialise with people yeah, and yeah. it becomes an image of ourself rather than perhaps the communities. I think it was all brilliant actually and um, I hope I have some responses to them. Um, <laughs> but I think on the, uh, I think in the first generation of, of migrants when they moved out, they, they didn't move out 45 kilometres from the CBD and they, they also moved to places that relatively had jobs for them. So the collapse of manufacturing, so in, in Sydney manufacturing has halved in the last 15 years as employment and the knowledge economy has doubled. So I think, we're, I think that's what's changed. I think the, uh, so that the, 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 the lifestyle worked with the economic offer at that point. It doesn't at this point in time. So it's forcing people into long journeys in their car with all the implications of that for them, not, not for me, but for them. I think your other point about um, uh, planners designing liking certain things, and I agree with that, which is why I sort of raced through it when I said that there's a professional challenge for us, that we understand the attractions and economic draw of density, for example. But that's not been the kind of, uh, you know, Southern Hemisphere, Australasian sort of way of looking at it. We've lots of space, so let's fill it. So I think what's changed, I think, is the, is the, the, is the economic challenge of that and the fact that um, that's not leading to the economic inclusion in a way that it did in a previous generation. So I, I make no moral judgment about that. I just think it's not working as well as it did before. In terms of your point about uh, technology, I, I wrote this thing about the, uh, a couple of years ago uh, uh, about the, um, uh, the fiber in, in Australia and New Zealand when for a company called Huawei, the Chinese company is delivering it in, in, in New Zealand. And I entered it um, saying that I say in it that you can decentralize economic activity. But I've read a lot, a lot of things recently. I've sort of seen this happen. But there, there's a guy called Enrico Moretti, uh, written a very compelling piece of work called The New Economic Geography of Jobs. Ed Glazer says the same sort of things. Essentially, um, the, the new technology is, is, is actually reshaping. It is reshaping. It's slower than we think in terms of that radical shift. It's partly because people still like face-to-face, face-to-face you know, ec economically, the knowledge spillovers you get from that. But what I do think is this and this is massive for developers, the tall towers, if you think about it, were designed in the era of the, of the uh, mainframe. And they, 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 they were big, expensive beasts that had to be funded by putting all these clever people in, in one place. The, the iPad world is sort of redesigning work, but it's, at the moment, the stage we're at is the innovation district, which is the mixed use, walkable. That's where the economic uh, implications of new technology are located at this point in time. Okay. Uh, there's a question over there. Then we've got Patrick down the far end there. Then there's one over there. So we'll go here first. Hi, my name's Helga Arlington. I represent an area that is gentrifying, Sandringham in Auckland. Yeah. And it has the benefit that the new residents love the South Asian restaurants that are currently there. I can see it. So it's synergy. It's working now. What would be your advice for keeping it like that, getting the benefits across the whole community? It's, it's two things about that. Uh, there are, um, 
places always change and they go up and they go down, I, I think, in, in all sorts of ways. But, but I think what's missing from the discussion um, is, is uh, affordable housing is a, is, a, is a real big issue, I think. The, the discussion... Um, there's, I have to, I'll tell you something which you, you don't have to believe. Many of the things I say tonight you don't have to believe at all. But uh, the, this, this one. Um, so I was working for the government and in the UK and we suddenly realised that the price of houses was, was not being determined by how many you built. And it kind of completely subverted our notion of supply and demand. And we suddenly realised that uh, you can't reduce the price of housing simply by building more of it. Because, well, no, but, but it's because... Nine, but the reason is there's a logical and political problem with it because 98% of the houses already exist in a market. And they're the ones that determine the price. So it's almost impossible. I've never seen... And the only conditions in which it could be done is, 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 is politically impossible where you build 15 to 20% extra homes in a year, collapse the price, and then you get voted out at the next election. So, <laughs> so, so it doesn't happen in a democracy. But, but the point, I think, is this. Therefore, we, we, our, our, our hunt to make housing affordable is deluded but we have to do something called affordable housing which is probably about using public land a lot more probably intensifying public housing a lot more than it is for example in the southern initiative there are lots of opportunities i would think for intensification on existing plots estate renew estate renewal which would give more opportunity to more people to actually stay in, in an area that is going up but they're not going to get kicked out because they can't afford to buy but that also means we have to move slightly away from ownership back to rent, but that's a completely different argument. Patrick. Uh, hi, Tim. Uh, Patrick McVeigh, formerly London Development Agency. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> well, of the many uh, organisations we abolished. Uh, <laughs> yeah. well, actually, I, I, did, I did the consultancy around its abolition. But um, a <laughs> uh, question, I guess a comment from you and then an opportunity for John to comment as well. Um, the challenge of multi-level governance and how you, you know, lessons about influencing national government expenditure in an area like the Thames Gateway. Yeah. And there may be a comment for John on kind of the task that, that he's got and we've got in the Southern Initiative of doing the same where there's always more national expenditure than there is local government expenditure. Okay, so let, let's take Tim first and then go to John. Um, I, uh, the, uh, we, we managed to capture the, the as you know, Patrick, the, the, the new, you know, the new Labour government in 97 looking for a project on its doorstep. So we were, very, we were very lucky that we found, they found us, we found them. But I think that proposition that, that uh, to government, central government, that we're wasting a lot of public money in these places because we haven't worked out how they work. And by, by sorting them out structurally, over the next 30 years, we can save ourselves a shed load of, of cash and improve performance and outcomes is a very compelling offer. I believe it to be true. John. Um, perhaps... Uh, perhaps the, um, uh, the point I would make is, first of all, we've done some comparative deprivation work. In South Auckland, between 1991 and 2013 census, the deprivation 10, which is the worst, yeah. or 8, 9 and 10, which is um, the worst, is actually increasing. So between 1991 and 2013, deprivation in South Auckland is increasing. At the point at which currently of the $24 billion that central government spends in Auckland, I estimate that $12 billion of that yeah. is spent in South Auckland. And of the $3.5 billion that Auckland City spends in Auckland, about 960 million, we estimate, is spent in the south. The city expenditure is primarily in roads, yeah. um, water treatment and um, wastewater treatment. Uh, the central government expenditure is first of all in social welfare, yeah. where one third, I estimate, are dependent on a welfare benefit of approximately 300,000 people. 100,000, I believe, are dependent. They're not drawing the benefit, but you might have a parent who is drawing the benefit and is a child dependent, so that's two people, or an unemployment benefit yeah. in a household of four. 
that's unemployed or that is supporting. So the biggest expenditure of central government in the south is Ministry of Social Development, followed by tertiary. And here I think there is some hope and solution because we have three tertiary institutions. Yeah, it's important. We have Monaco Institute of Technology. We have the new growing south campus of Auckland University of Technology and the Wananga, and some really um, su starting to be quite successful <coughs> large secondary schools. And health, of course, is the third big spender, followed by the fourth, which is law and order. So we have a mix in south of the wicked problems. And what we need to do is not necessarily spend a lot more money. Yeah, we actually need to redirect the ship in terms of the way we spend money in Auckland City to invest into the south for the benefit of Auckland as a whole, but to redirect some of the spend that central government is spending in the south. So I think that's, cri I think that's critical. I think, um, I think business as usual will not transform you know, the southern uh, area. That, that's, the, that's a fundamental point. I think the second thing is the resources exist in the way that you say, but need to be redirected. So it's like structural investment rather than just welfare money. You, can, you will save yourselves a lot of money in the long term by doing this. I think the third thing, though, you've got some anchors that you've already pointed out. Um, and I would just say that uh, thinking through um, the, the challenge of this higher density development. So you've got your, you've got your universities and you've got a number of um, things that are moving for you. But if 80% of people are still living in, in uh, you know, individual homes in 30 years' time, some of the outcomes will be repeated. I do actually feel strongly that urban form is quite an important part of this. And the last thing is about the, mi the mix. I, th I, th I think the challenge, I think it's this huge issue. And, I, and I'm you know, somebody who's a, from a Welsh background, I speak Welsh, and I'm very, very clear that some of the change factors themselves might bring economic uplift, but they bring challenges to culture and cultural continuity, and I think that's a big issue. And, and if I just make a point here, is that the intensification and, if you like, the urban design and activation of Manuko, uh, what that has those anchors of those tertiaries, yeah. good connectivity, good yeah. transportation, yeah. increasing, we should increase uh, urban density in the Manuko area. I think that is about Sounds creating good. that polycentric, that there are other viable nodes within yep. a city. Yep. Coming back, though, to the, to the question that was asked earlier about what's the governance possibilities here and what's the activity there, I think really we've got to have a collaborative arrangement that exists not only with the Auckland councillors governing body but with the ministers of the state. Um, I'd almost suggest that what we do need is we do need from central government is a cabinet subcommittee focused on South Auckland where we have joined up uh, political leadership. We've got it in Christchurch for a particular event there and I think we should be doing the same in South Auckland. John, I think it's critical. The, uh, <coughs> the Thames Gateway Strategic Partnership was a cabinet, was a cabinet committee and uh, the minister brought the minister for development for planning brought five or six ministers to the table four or five times a year in an external way to meet with local councils to do it together but it was all, it, but there was a cabinet committee behind it doing cross government stuff for an area and i don't think you can do it any other way okay now we had we had a question there and then then yes so uh, my name's richard reed um, question to tim uh, you you uh, mentioned Ed Glazer before, and I wanted to ask a question uh, for you to reflect upon that one of his central theses of uh, the triumph of cities is that cities don't attract poverty or deprivation, they actually attract people who want to get out of poverty from somewhere else. And uh, in your uh, findings on East London, you talked about the kind of the missing, missing statistics of people who move, move away, that sort of internal <coughs> migration within cities. So um, is that something, do you agree with his thesis or do you have a different perspective? It's interesting. <coughs> I get very annoyed by Ed Glazer, actually. Um, and that, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's city-ness and then there's city triumphalism. And I, I'm sort of tired of, tired of it. He wants to walk away from Detroit. And I, you know, I, uh, I don't think that's uh, necessary. But um, I, was, I, am, I was struck by the fact that uh, 
I am, I am interested in the way that places either get taken up by the uneven development of capitalism uh, or get abandoned by the uneven development of capitalism. And I kind of personally lived through it. You know, the, uh, that mining community I grew up in was extraordinarily successful and vital for about 40 years. And I lived through the end of it. You know. um, I think, um, but I think the, that cities are going to create, cities are always going to create um, successful, if you like, they're always going to create, they're always going to be slightly uneven. They're always going to have places where some of the poor people congregate. The issue is, is that a permanent state for that part of town? Or is there, and if, you know, do we know what is causing that to happen and can we intervene in that? But I am also interested in this social mobility of individuals. I, 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 in East London, the, um, you know, more people than we knew were actually going out to the suburbs, but that was in the last 20 years. I just think what's, the, what's really galvanized the discussion now is that that route is no longer the route to economic success. And the problem with all this is that we're all now piling into the same space. This is really the problem. The, the unaffordability of our cities is partly because the industri uh, uh, industrial restructuring has led to a premium on knowledge jobs in one place, whereas manufacturing was more diverse. We haven't got a public policy to respond to this, but I've tried to have the discussion tonight about it. OK, Graham. Uh, thank you very much for your talk, Tim. That was uh, very um, uh, uh, enlightening. Um, you spoke about taking the people with you and involving the people who already live in the, the place you're developing, and I totally get that. The problem we have, particularly in New Zealand, it seems, um, that if we take too long about our development plans and spend too long talking, the developers come in and bugger it up for us before we've actually moved. So I wondered what your opinion is of uh, the Baron Hausmann approach, which of course gave us Paris, uh, but was not very democratic. It's also the Robert Moses uh, approach to New York, um, and that produced uh, the equal and opposite force that was Jane Jacobs. And I, I kind of think, I hate to be balanced in the middle of the road about this, because I'm intrinsically clearly not, but uh, is, I kind of think you need a bit of, bit of both in your, in your city, you know, the, the economic dynamism that was Moses in his mad way, and then the kind of humanizing force that Jane Jacobs was. Uh, I, I do think, in terms of community engagement, I, I mean, it's funny, I, I, having made planning applications myself, I once wrote a, the most appalling sentence about community engagement. It caused me endless grief. I wrote a sentence uh, which said, whenever I hear the word community, I reach for my Kalashnikov. Right? <laughs> and uh, it was the, the unwisest moment in my, in, my, in my career. I meant well. The, uh, <laughs> what I meant was, of course, but I do think, I do think this, though, I, I've suddenly realized this over the last couple of years in, in Sydney, is that the, the way in which we, this is critical, the way in which we engage with community is very 19th century. And we end up, we end up with a, a few adversarial forces in a meeting, which I've done 500 times. Of, I think they're the same nine people, actually. <laughs> and uh, we've, we haven't found a way. I think there are ways. I think online engagement, I th it's interesting. When you do online engagement about stuff, you find that young people, you find that ethnic minorities, you find that women get much more engaged in discussions about their city than, than if you have a three-hour meeting and a row in a public place. So I think how we do it is quite important. OK, we've got time for one more question. Uh, yes, the gentleman. On Thanks for the talk, Tim. Very enjoyable. Uh, my question is... Oh, could you introduce yourself? Uh, my name's Ray Talbot. Um, has there been a correlation done between house ownership and the sort of success of an area? My, my view is that if the housing is rented, the, the, own, the occupants don't necessarily take pride, not only in their property, but in the area. So if there was a sort of a funded, assisted house pur purchase scheme, would that be a benefit, do you think? It's a, it's a very important point, and it's a good way of, of ending a discussion, which because it, it brings a number of things together. I think that... Um, so I think that the, 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 it fits also with this thing about churn in a population in East London and whether, whether you think this is familiar in other places. So what I mean by that is if you're only going to be in a place for five years because it's a way station, because you arrive, you're a migrant, you arrive in, in London, you go to East London because it's affordable, and then when you're successful, you leave, the question about that is do you, do you put any roots down in that area? Do you care about the area? Do you campaign for it? Do you intervene in it? Do you do anything? other than just live there and go to a job and then move out. 
And I think there is an issue around, um, there's a very interesting discussion about rent versus ownership in terms of anchoring somebody in a community. And I think your point about, uh, which I would probably call, I think it's shared equity is the same sort of thing, which is you, there's a rent to buy kind of approach, which I think is going to be more and more important as we find our cities less affordable, is to find ways to uh, enable people to go from rent to buy in the same, in the same unit. But I think it's, uh, it plays to the theme of the, of the night, which is uh, that uh, inner places with lots of churn, um, do they care about the, the, the place? Um, but if you, but, but, you know, in a place of lots of churn, there's also social mobility for the individuals to discuss all this, as we've just done. So the, um, if I could say that in South Auckland, the first special housing area that was announced has been led by the Tamaki Makoto Iwi Collective and with partners, Housing Foundation and so on. It's very good. It is social and affordable and it is shared equity. Very good. The second one is in Ōtara, which is a large papakaiinga housing area, and again, at the basis of that is that concept. I think it's fantastic. I, I, can I just say one thing, and I promise this is the last thing, the, uh, <laughs> and I'm a Welsh liar, is, um, <laughs> is that what I think is really unique about the New Zealand circumstance, and we, we talked about this, and I've, I've been here and thought about it a bit, is that the, the existence of iwi and, and the, the fact that we're talking about a place where in, in other places we would, we would say the big economic drivers are dealing with, if you like, if you like communities that are not as, as well formed as they were, they would have been 50, 60 years ago in an old fashioned community in, in Britain, but also atomized individuals to some degree. You know, people who come into a big urban setting and, and don't have the kind of social networks. If you're talking about a big process of change where there is an existing strong community that has clear ideas and some assets, I think that could be a quite a benign process of change in which the community itself isn't just engaged rhetorically, but actually has assets to put on the table and objectives to shape the final result. So I think two things about this, by the way, John, I think, uh, Roger, the, the, the coming together of, what, on the one hand, a structural governance discussion with the central government about the Thames Gateway Strategic Partnership yeah, yeah. concept as a cabinet committee, cross government, but working with local government. It exists in nature, this is what we did, right? But the fact that you've got community um, vitality and, and assets, I think can lead to a, a result in which you can get change and also get the community to be the beneficiaries of change in a way that I think is not so available in other places. I end on a, on a I think, a rationally optimistic note. Okay, well, that, that's a good note to end on. So I'd just like to propose the vote of thanks uh, to Tim. But before I do, can I just draw to your attention at the back of the room, we've got these uh, news theatres uh, about the Southern Initiative, which John and his team uh, produce. I encourage you to take one. It'll give you an idea of, of uh, the exciting things that are happening in the Southern Initiative area. So um, I'd like to, th to thank Tim for, for uh, giving us what I think is a very deep understanding of uh, the social dynamics of cities and communities. And I'd like to um, suggest some take-home messages that I've taken out of uh, uh, the comments that Tim's made tonight. Uh, he talked about uh, convergence or the process of closing the gap in performance and prospects and in so doing to bring benefits to all. Uh, he talked about innovation districts, a uh, mix of all workable districts, and uh, he, he talked what uh, seemed to me to be like a five-point plan, which was around uh, focused on creating wealth and reducing poverty, uh, supporting healthier lifestyles, creating neighbourhoods of choice and connection, uh, rebalancing the urban settlement pattern, and communities shaping the change. Uh, but I have to say, Tim, I thought the, the most memorable quote, quote of the, the night uh, was, uh, and it's worth repeating, I'm not an alcoholic, I only drink when <laughs> Richie McCaw is offside. <laughs> so, Tim uh, Williams, thank you very much. <clears throat>